Hello, I'm Graham Steele, CEO and founder of CryptoSense, and welcome to session four of our crypto and cryptography risk training. So if you're with us for the first three sessions, you'd have had an overview of cryptography and how it can go wrong. In session three, we went in deep in understanding what a, a encryption function is, a cipher. And now in today's session, we're gonna look at encryption modes and how they give rise to attacks uh, when they're incorrectly used. So let's get straight on with it. So we're going to look at what are called modes of operation and, and padding systems or padding modes, uh, since this is the way that things uh, often go wrong. We'll look at some of the most common errors and a few uh, slightly not so common ones. And we'll do a, a little concrete example to understand how to break a misused uh, mode of operation. And finally, we'll look at a uh, slightly more technical set of attacks based around what are called padding oracles, so exploiting uh, the use of particular padding modes. So what is a mode of operation? So in the last session, we talked about ciphers, particularly block ciphers. So these are functions that take a block, a fixed size block of plain text and turn it into a fixed size block of ciphertext. So this is great, but what if the data that I have to encrypt is bigger than the block size? Uh, maybe a lot bigger because block sizes are typically something like 128 uh, bits. Uh, or I maybe don't even know how big my data is. I just have a stream of data coming in and I want to be able to encrypt it. And I want to be able to use a block cipher to do that. Uh, so I'm going to have to figure out how to apply this block cipher to this stream of data I don't yet even know the size of. Okay, so now I need modes of operation. So here is the simplest mode of operation for a cipher, block cipher function. This is called the electronic codebook mode or ECB mode. So it's very, very simple. I have a block cipher that has a key, the same key in every instance. And for every block of plain text that I need to do an encryption, I'm just gonna chop up my plain text basically into the blocks that are right size my function and just put them in uh, to the function and collect the, the cipher text that comes out uh, at the end. I'm going to concatenate all of those ciphertexts together, and that's going to give me my, my full ciphertext. So it's basically, I mean, what is the simplest possible way that I could use this fixed length block cipher to encrypt, in this case, three blocks uh, of length of, of plain text? Um, but in fact, doing, uh, doing it this way is extremely bad, both for confidentiality uh, and integrity. So it can be easy for a attacker in practice to get hold of the plain text, and certainly it can be very easy for the attacker to manipulate the ciphertext in such a way that I receive something that wasn't what, what my interlocutor intended to, to have me receive. So as an example, uh, here is the logo of the, the, the Carfoscari uh, University, um, which is where our co-founder and chief scientific officer, Professor Ricardo Vicardi works. So if I take that logo uh, encoded into bitmaps and I encrypt it, uh, using a random key and using ECB mode, and then I visualize the ciphertext uh, as bitmaps, I get the result on the right. And so you can see that in, in practice, I can still pretty much figure out what that, that image is, right? So uh, it's coming through in the same deterministic pattern for each kind of uh, bitmap that I get on the left. And so that's allowing me to figure out what it is uh, on the right. So this is a really nice visual way to understand why ECB uh, is bad, but it's important to understand that ECB is actually a lot worse than this, right? So it isn't just something that if you use it to encrypt a picture, might let the, uh, the picture sneak out. Uh, there are actually ways that you can figure out precisely what a plain text message is from ECB. So for example, uh, imagine a system where an attacker can force the encryption function to uh, add some kind of prefix to the plain text that it's going to encrypt. Uh, so this might sound a little bit uh, nuts, but in fact, in practice in systems, uh, live systems on the internet, this kind of thing is very typical. You might use, for example, the username uh, that, that you're putting into um, a box somewhere on a website, and that might be being part of the message that's being encrypted. And so I can use that to fix the first part of what the, the plain text is. And then what I'm gonna do is prepend 15 uh, known bytes to, to an ECP message. Uh, and then the only byte that remains is the, the 16th byte. So this is in the case of a 128 bit uh, block cipher. Uh, and then to just figure that out, I can just brute force guess all of the possible values, 256 possible values for that 16th byte and figure out which one matches uh, the ciphertext. So what I'm doing then is by uh, adding my own uh, 16 bytes to the beginning of the message with my guesses in. 
uh, and iterate all of those, and then I can figure out that byte of the plain text. And then I can repeat this again by uh, prepending 14 known bytes, plus the byte that I just guessed that's the first byte of the real message, and then re repeating the attack over the 16th byte. And so byte by byte, I can figure out the value of the entire plain text. And there are loads of variations of this. Basically, if you use ECB, it's very, very hard to not fall into one of these uh, kinds of traps. So ECB is essentially something that we uh, try to avoid using under any circumstances. And it's a good thing to look out for in a, a review of code. Uh, and indeed, most static analysis tools will look for use of ECB these days. So let's look at another way that we could do encrypting uh, along plain text uh, and try and sort of mix it up a bit so that it's not so easy for, for an attacker to, to play around with the blocks and, and attack us. So here's, here's an interesting idea. What about if we do uh, what we're going to call cipher block chaining mode? So in, in this mode, I'm going to introduce something called an initialization vector. We're going to see more about those uh, later. Uh, so in this case, that can just be a, a random value. Uh, it doesn't matter if I uh, let that random value be known to an attacker. In fact, it's going to be important to send that uh, random value along with the ciphertext in order to get the decryption done. So I'm going to establish an initialization vector. I'm going to XOR that against the plain text. So that's that uh, little cross in the, in the round there. So that's the exclusive OR operation, bitwise exclusive OR between the IV and the plain text. Uh, and then I'm going to put that through my block cipher encryption function. And then I'm going to get the ciphertext out. So that's going to give me the first block of my ciphertext. And then for the second block, I'm going to take that ciphertext result, and I'm going to use that in the place of the IV for block number two. So I'm going to then XOR that against uh, plain text block number two. I'm going to run that through my block cipher, and I'm going to get my output out, and that's going to be ciphertext block number two. And then again, I'm going to keep ciphertext block number two, and I'm going to XOR that against plain text block number three, and then that's going to give me ciphertext block number three, et cetera, et cetera. And if I had more blocks, I'd continue doing that. So that's why it's called uh, cipher block chaining. Uh, and so you can see pretty quickly that this won't suffer from the same problems of uh, ECB because uh, when I randomize that IV, I'm going to, that's going to be unpredictable for uh, anybody who's, um, for example, put together a, an image into a, a bitmap. And so I'm going to get something completely non-interpretable uh, in terms of ciphertext because each ciphertext is, is sort of being perturbed, you could say, by a different value in that IV each time. Uh, and so if I have the same block of plain text in block number one and in block number three, I'm not going to get the same ciphertext in block number one and block number three, because the IV that was used in block number one was the initial IV, and the IV that was used in, in the place of the IV in block number three was ciphertext block number two, which was something totally unpredictable for me. So basically, this gets around that basic problem with, with ECB. Because this is how uh, CBC decryption works. So it happens just as you expect. You take the first block of the ciphertext, you run it through the decryption function, and you XOR it against the IV. So that's why you need to have the IV uh, known to the, the party doing the decryption. And by the properties of bitwise XOR, the XORs cancel out, and I get back the, the plain text. Uh, so you can see if uh, a, an attacker were to try to tamper with a block, then that would uh, corrupt the next block of plain text. So let's say an attacker tries to fiddle around with the ciphertext bits in, in block two, uh, then not only will that result in a different uh, block coming out as the plain text um, in block two, it'll also corrupt uh, block three because it'll result in a different value being used as the IV uh, in, in block three. So this might, you think in a way, uh, allow you to, to detect when the attacker has done this, but in practice, this doesn't give you very uh, good protection uh, on integrity. And we'll talk a little bit later about in the padding oracles about how, in fact, this property can, can be dangerous. So there's a whole bunch of other ways that we can do uh, chaining together of blocks into modes. Uh, so we, we're not going to go into details of these, but this one's called output uh, feedback mode encryption. So um, we can see it's got an interesting property of essentially generating a string that I can uh, use uh, to XOR against the plain text to produce my ciphertext for, for each block. Uh, and so the interesting thing about this is that it sort of constructs something like a stream cipher. Um, and we can um, generate these uh, encryption blocks in advance. We can figure out what the IV is and generate all these things. And then we can have a very, very fast XOR operation to do when we want to do the ciphertext or, or the plain text uh, operations. And we can even do them in parallel uh, if we've pre-calculated that uh, IV stream. Um, but it's very, very important, as in all these uh, sort of stream ciphers, that we never use the same IV uh, twice. Um, and we'll look at exactly uh, why that is. Uh, here's another modern mode. So this is counter mode encryption. Uh, it's sort of a, a variation uh, where we don't need to feed in information from the previous operation. So that improves the possibility of doing uh, parallelized uh, large scale 
encryption and decryption. We essentially set a, a nonce uh, append a counter to that to give uh, unique blocks so we get unique uh, bits for our uh, key stream. And then again, we do an XOR between the plain text and the cipher text um, to, to get out our block. So we XOR the result of the encryption with the plain text to get the cipher text. And we do the XOR again to, to get it back again. Uh, and again, we only need access to the encryption mode of the function, not the decryption mode, which is also quite useful. So we're going to look a little bit about authentication. So an authenticated mode for encryption gives us both authentication and confidentiality. So confidentiality, remember, is just uh, that I can't uh, figure out what the plaintext was. But authentication means that I can't uh, forge a valid ciphertext. So if I'm an attacker, I can't give you something which will look like a valid ciphertext. You'll be able to tell that I've uh, tampered that or that I didn't have access to uh, the encryption key. So there are modes of operation which provide us with both authentication and uh, confidentiality. For example, uh, CCM mode and GCM mode. Uh, Galois counter mode, so GCM mode, is probably the most widely used best practice mode now. So this is what you'll find being offered, for example, by the major uh, cloud um, KMS services as their uh, best practice encryption. And it definitely is best practice to use authenticated encryption, and, and we'll show concretely why that is uh, later. But even if you're not susceptible to one of those kind of attacks, uh, it tends to be uh, that that can cause all sorts of problems if you don't have authentication, uh, and there's a possibility of the attacker tampering with the ciphertext. Uh, so a few words about uh, padding. So when uh, we have a big plain text uh, to put into a block cipher, it can often be the case that once we've divided up the plain text, it's not an exact multiple of the block size. And so there's a sort of leftover half block at the end that we need to, to pad out to be big enough to go into the cipher function. And so we need to do that in a standardized way because we need to make it clear to the decryptor that this little bit at the end is the padding and that they should throw it away to get back the original message. So we need to have an unambiguous way of doing that. Uh, the most widely used way is uh, what's called PKCS5 uh, padding. Uh, this comes from a uh, public key uh, standard uh, from the RSA company that's now uh, a little old, but it's still the most widely used thing. Uh, and essentially what this says is if we need uh, five bytes of data to reach the, uh, the block size, so we need to round up the remaining block by five bytes, then we would add 0505505 to the end, and, and that would be recognizable as the padding. So five blocks of five or four blocks of four, three blocks of three, whatever it is, that's going to be our uh, padding. So we need to know also about default mode. So sometimes if we, uh, in practice, we actually don't specify the mode that's going to be used, uh, Java will select one for us, and that selection will depend on the CSP, so it will depend on the provider that's uh, in use. Uh, so here's an example of, of a bit of code running where we um, we actually don't uh, we actually say no padding, but uh, no padding doesn't work when you have a message that isn't a, a exact multiple of the block size, and in fact the CSP will go ahead and do its padding anyway uh, and give us some some padding that we're going to have to take away afterwards. Uh, so the, what I'm trying to point out here is that even if you don't see in the code, oh, I want to use PKCS5 padding, you might well find that your CSP is doing PKCS5 padding for you anyway. So you've got that padding there, which you need to be aware of. So let's talk about how uh, these encryptions can go wrong then. So we've seen a whole bunch of things about modes now. It all sort of looks reasonable, but in practice, we've, we've seen some uh, very uh, easy ways to shoot yourself uh, in the foot. So let's say um, I have these, I've seen these two ciphertext uh, messages uh, go over the wire. Uh, so I'm the intruder, I'm trying to figure out what's in there. Uh, and let's say that I find out that the first ciphertext uh, corresponds to the message, uh, dear Graham, I'll be happy to participate in the training. Uh, so you remember if we go right back to the beginning when we started talking about encryption and what it is to be secure in encryption, it's important that an encryption scheme is secure even if Sometimes it leaks out some messages, some pairs of messages between plain text and cipher text. It should be the case that that's not enough to allow the intruder to recover any more plain text. Uh, now, suppose we use uh, CTR mode, so that's a mode I showed a few slides ago, the counter mode, with a fixed initialization vector. So you remember I said the initialization vector, you must never use the same one twice. What about if something goes wrong and I accidentally hard code the IV as a particular value and I use the same one twice? So how could I break out the other uh, plain text from the second ciphertext from ciphertext two. Uh, well, remember how counter modes works. So if I use the same IV, that essentially means I'm using the same uh, nonce in CTR. So I've got the same nonce string and then the same counter string uh, afterwards. Uh, so that means that I'm going to be doing the XOR with the same values uh, each time. Uh, 
Um, so when I get the whole key stream out, the, the, key, the key stream K is going to be the same for the XOR between plain text one uh, and key, which gives me cipher text one, and plain text two and the key, which is going to give me cipher text two. And so I can just rearrange uh, a little bit of, of algebra here and use the fact that um, the XORs cancel out to figure out that I can get hold for myself uh, of uh, the value of plain text two by taking plain text one. XORed with ciphertext one and then XORing it with ciphertext uh, two. And if I go ahead and implement that, I will actually find out the value of that message. So you can go ahead and do that. Uh, the slides there will be at the end of the exercise and you can read the secret message that, that comes out. You don't need to know anything more of the key, you don't need to know anything else more about the cipher, you just need to be able to implement the XOR. So that's an easy way to break a misused uh, cipher. And that really does go wrong in practice. Fixed IVs, four stream ciphers is a, is a real hazard that happens out there in the wild. Uh, so let's look at something a little bit more sophisticated, which is padding oracle attacks. So padding oracle attacks are attacks that exploit the side channel leak of information that comes when we signal padding errors. So what does that mean? So we have a padding oracle when an application exhibits to a potential attacker uh, some different behavior, which allows us to infer that a padding error has been found uh, while it's decrypting a ciphertext. So a padding error is just that the plain text final block was not correctly padded, which means I couldn't work out what it should be. It's not uh, unambiguously padded, so I don't know what it is, so, so I, I don't know what it could do when I carry on, so therefore I signal an error. Uh, so that's the first ingredient that the attacker needs. Then the attacker also needs to be able to manipulate the ciphertext, at least to some extent. Depends on the attack, but generally speaking, we talk about uh, chosen ciphertext attacks where the attacker has a free choice uh, over the ciphertext. Uh, um, but this really does happen in practice, uh, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit uh, later about some examples. Uh, but for example, even in very expensive and highly secure uh, security devices, you can find these kind of padding oracle attacks. Okay, so let's remember how PKCS5 or PKCS7 padding works. So uh, if we need five bytes of padding, we add 0, 05, 0, 05, 0, 05, 0, 05. So we can see what all the possible legitimate sets of uh, paddings uh, are. Um, okay, so that's that's fine. Now let's see how a padding oracle attack might work on uh, CBC. So what we're assuming is that the attacker has seen a ciphertext that they would like to know the plain text of, and they have a padding oracle, which means they have a way to send to the, the system a tampered ciphertext and figure out if it has a, uh, a padding error or not. So essentially, in principle, what you're going to do is take the last byte of the second to last block of the ciphertext, so you're, you're the attacker here, and you're essentially going to fiddle with it, so keep uh, XORing a different uh, value with it, until you, uh, as a result, get a 0, 1 at the end of the final block of plaintext, which will be accepted as a padding. So what what's exactly is going on here? So what's happening is that bit that you're fiddling with at the end of the ciphertext of the, the penultimate block is going to be used to XOR against the final byte of the uh, result of the ciphertext going through the decryption function just before it comes out into the plain text. So what that means is you can change through all 256-bit values uh, at the end of the ciphertext of the penultimate block, and you will be just changing one by one all the possible values of the plain text. And so you can definitely at some point get a zero one there, which will be uh, accepted uh, as a padding. And when you've got that, you now know what value you need to XOR against the last block of the real plain text to get zero one. So you can just do that XOR and figure out what the last block of the plain text is. Uh, so what you're going to do is essentially iterate through that for all uh, bytes uh, i until you get that uh, zero one at the end. Um, and then you know for that byte i that that's exactly identical to the real value of the plain text in the last block. Uh, so what do you do for the next byte? So first of all, you, you set the last block of the penultimate block of ciphertext to get a zero two at the end of the plain text. So you know that zero two now because you know what value to set to, to get that. And now you iterate on the penultimate byte of the penultimate block of the ciphertext until you get 0202 at the end of the resulting plain text, which will again be accepted. So your padding oracle uh, will signal to you that this has been accepted as, a, as the correct padding. Now, again, you can repeat your calculation, figure out what the penultimate block of plain text of the last plain text block is. There are some um, particular corner cases for what happens if the final block of plain text that you're trying to break happens to, in fact, already be correctly padded. 
Um, but you can do a bit of bit math to figure out uh, how to do that when you get uh, two uh, yes answers or two correctly padded answers from, from your attack. So that's how to do a padding oracle attack on CBC um, with PKCS5 padding. There are also other ways to do padding oracle attacks. So uh, RSA encryption, the typical way it's done has a padding oracle attack as well. Uh, the most common mode for RSA encryption is RSA PKCS1 v1.5 padding. This has been known to be vulnerable to a padding oracle attack since 1998, um, known as the million message attack and due to Daniel Bleichenbecker. But this uh, attack keeps coming back, it keeps being found in real systems again and again, even when we think we've added countermeasures for them. And you can read a blog post on CryptoSense about this and why we should get rid of it. There is a secure mode for RSA encryption if you have to use it, which is OAEP. You have to be careful to make sure you're using a good implementation of it, but uh, it is in general secure against panning Oracle attacks. Just a few references here to, uh, if you wanna go deeper into understanding how the CBC uh, padding Oracle attack works. So it first came uh, to light in a paper by um, Swiss professor of cryptography, Serge Audenay. Um, and then it came very much back to consciousness, particularly amongst the hacker community uh, in 2010, uh, after a paper showing basically how you can do this in loads of real systems that we, we thought had been fixed way back in 2002. Uh, I was involved in a paper in 2012 at Crypto, at the IACR Cryptography Conference, explaining how the padding oracle attacks, both for RSA and for CBC, uh, can be found on real cryptographic devices in, in all sorts of circumstances, uh, and offering improvements to the way that the black and back a million message attack works. That means that in practice, you can often get away with only 10,000 uh, different messages to, to make it work. Uh, so recommended reading, of course. Uh, so that concludes our session today. So we've seen a little bit about what kind of modes there are around for doing encryption. And we've seen some of the most common errors. So using the same IV in a stream cipher and using uh, unauthenticated encryption um, for CBC mode. Uh, so the way to stop that CBC mode attack is to use one of the authenticated modes uh, or to authenticate the ciphertext so that they can't be manipulated by the, by the attacker. Uh, so next time, we're going to dive uh, a little bit deeper into uh, more cryptography. So we're going to go through the rest of the series through uh, signatures, through hash functions, uh, through key management, and through uh, password-based uh, cryptography. So uh, do subscribe to the channel to see when they're uh, available. And I'll see you again here soon uh, on the channel.